and welcome back to the afternoon session of the HIV treatment update. Um, as mentioned before, feel free to ask questions in the chat and I'll relay those across as uh, when we can, if there's time available. Um, it gives me great pleasure now to invite Dr. Sue McAllister to present. Um, Sue does amazing work and is a great value to the HIV sector. Um, she's with the University of Otago Department of Preventative and uh, Preventive and Social Medicine in Dunedin, and it's a lead of the AIDS Epidemiology Group and provides us great insight as to, into what's happening with HIV in New Zealand. So um, Sue is presenting on From Diagnosis to Quality of Life, which is where we want to move towards. Um, and Quality of Life is the most important piece for people living with HIV. So I'm pleased to have her join us now. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, really appreciate that that welcome and it's um, really lovely to be with you all this afternoon and um, greetings from the deep south. Um, I'm actually doing this um, call from Gore um, and believe it or not, it is sunny. Um, so I I'll just share my screen with you now and then we'll get started. Okay, is that all right for everybody? Yep. Great. Um, so many of you will um, have heard presentations that I've given in the past, and often um, the focus has been sort of primarily on new diagnoses and um, the EPI update and you know who's been diagnosed and what what are their characteristics. So the session today, I just want to move it a wee bit beyond that. Um, so looking from diagnosis to quality of life um, of people living with HIV and some results from some research that we carried out um, over the last couple of years. Uh, let's get this right. So just the overview of what I'm going to be um, presenting today. Um, many of you, again, will have seen uh, and heard about the UNAIDS target of 1990. So 90% um, of people living with HIV diagnosed, of those 90% on treatment, of whom 90% um, having an undetectable viral load. So I will present some information on the number of people diagnosed over the last few years. Then I'll go on to present some work that we've done on the cascade of care, um, those on treatment with an undetectable viral load. And then lastly, I will go on to um, the quality of life, which more recently papers have been um, talking about this being possibly the fourth 90. So this target of 90% of people living with HIV having good quality of life. So that's where we're going to in this next half hour. So this is the number of people who have been notified with HIV in New Zealand, and we've broken it down by place of first diagnosis. So the black line at the top is the first diagnoses in New Zealand. And so in 2020, there were 95 people diagnosed, and this was about a 50% reduction, which is really great news from that peak in 2016 of 196. The red line um, lower down is that those who had been first diagnosed overseas. So that had been creeping up a wee bit. Um, I suspect that that will be quite different this year. So if we um, just look at the people who are diagnosed in New Zealand, and this slide is of those, um, so those people diagnosed in New Zealand broken down by the main mode of acquisition. And so you'll see in the red line at the top that the main decline that we've seen over recent years has been in men who have sex with men. The blue line below that is of heterosexual men and women, which has stayed fairly stable at, at very low numbers over the last um, 10 years or so. If we just concentrate on the men who have sex with men, this is um, by place of acquisition. So the black line at the top is 
men who have sex with men thought to have acquired their HIV in New Zealand. And again, we can see that that main decline over the last five years has been um, in, in the acquisition in New Zealand. And so again, that peak in 2016, um, around half the number in 2020, which is really, really good news. And I think the other thing to point out here, apart from that dip um, in 2011, 2020 was the lowest number since the early 2000s. This slide shows um, the CD4 count at the time of diagnosis. And so this green line is a CD4 count of greater than or equal to 500. So a high CD4 count at the time of diagnosis. And so again, the main decline is in, is in men, men who have sex with men who have quite recently been um, infected or had acquired their HIV. This is the age, and I'm going to go through these really quickly, but the main decline is in men who have sex with men age 30 to 49. The main decline has been in European MSM. And the main decline over the last five years has been in MSM living in the northern Auckland region at the time of their diagnosis. If we have a look at the men and women with heterosexually acquired HIV, and this is by place of infection. And I think the main thing to note here is that um, acquired in New Zealand, which is the black line, or acquired overseas, fairly similar numbers and tracking along at also very low numbers, which is really good. The main thing that we always kind of point out with the heterosexual men and women is the very low CD4 count at the time of diagnosis. So a late diagnosis um, of around sort of 43%, 46% compared to around 30% in MSM. So just basically heterosexual men and women not being diagnosed in a timely way. Um, and one, just one slide looking at um, HIV from injecting drug use and very, very small numbers sitting at around one or two each year. Um, the dark blue is acquired in New Zealand, light blue acquired overseas, but fortunately very, very low numbers throughout um, the last 20 or so years. So just to summarize the, um, the EP data, so we've seen a decline in HIV diagnosed in New Zealand. This has mostly been an MSM, acquired in New Zealand, young age between 30 to 49 European and living in the Auckland region. And the main concern with heterosexual men and women is the late diagnosis. So if we can just turn now to look at the cascade of care. So um, a couple of years ago, we did some work um, to estimate the proportion of people um, who had been notified with HIV between 2006 to 2017 uh, and look at them, those people, and how many were on ART and had a suppressed viral load. So how we did this, so the AEG is the AIDS epidemiology group. Um, we did a lot of matching of data using the NHI with the Ministry of Health data set um, on antiretroviral therapy. Um, and also with viral load laboratories and clinical teams to find out the most recent viral load result. If anyone is interested, the results of that study has been written up um, and published in HIV medicine and the reference is there. So what we found from that, and there's a lot of information in this, but I think to primarily highlight that we found there was just on 95% of people in that time frame were on ART, um, but only 82% of those on ART were had a suppressed viral load. However, there's a few caveats in this um, data that make it very complicated. 
And the main things I've highlighted here in these um, red boxes that, so up here there were um, these people who we just could not find the um, report for, or the clinical data was not available for, or we didn't get complete data from the laboratories. And so the most current or the most recent viral load was unknown. So I would expect that those with a suppressed viral load we will be much higher than the 82%, but we just had a lot of unknown data that we couldn't, um, we couldn't make any other firm conclusions about. So we kind of repeated the similar process um, for more recent cases in 2018 and 2019, except this um, data was just information that we had received from post-diagnosis forms sent out to clinicians. So it wasn't doing all of the linking with Ministry of Health data set or the viral load laboratories. It was just purely from um, information sent in from clinicians. So this was a lot better. So it was 96% um, on ART and practically all of those on ART had a suppressed viral load. Unfortunately, the this, there were about 30% that we still didn't get that data available for. Um, so it's still slightly problematic. So where we're going to from here going forward is that we have got ethical approval to, to collect data annually from both the Ministry of Health um, antiretroviral therapy data and from the viral laboratories around the country. And so on an annual basis for the next three years, we will um, do that linkage using the NHI and hopefully we will be able to have a more complete data set and a more complete picture of what is happening with ART and viral load suppression. Um, so we've actually managed to, we've just received all of the data from those people in the last month. And so we will be able to work on that over the next two or three months and have that information ready for, for you next year. So moving on to um, quality of life. So um, I'm not sure many of you probably will have heard already about the Aotearoa New Zealand Stigma Index. Um, and this was a study that was um, being undertaken over the last couple of years, um, investigating stigma and discrimination in people living with HIV in, in New Zealand. It incorporated um, the MEPA principle, so the meaningful invo involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS. So we, on our working group, we had people living with HIV, so inputting into all aspects of this um, stigma index study. It was a convenient sample of participants living with HIV um, aged 18 years and over. So there were a total of 188 people who took part. In-person interviews and the overall aim was to look at stigma and discrimination, but the part that I'm going to pull out today was to measure quality of life and to look at some of those characteristics that might be associated with quality of life in people living with HIV. So the, the quality of life measure that we used in that study was called POSQUAL. So this is, um, POSQUAL was developed by Professor Graham Brown and his colleagues in um, La Trobe University in Melbourne. So there were these 13 questions, which you can see on the screen here. Um, I worry about my health, I'm enjoying life. Um, I lack a sense of belonging with people around me. So each of these questions, participants were asked to, to rate what they thought between, you know, if they said, I worry about my health, one, not at all, through to five, extremely worried, worried about their health. So from the answers that they gave, we could sum 
these seven, these 13 questions. And so potentially people could have the lowest possible score was 13 with the highest being, being 65. We also were able to categorize these scores once they were summed um, into either. So what, oh no, sorry, um, just to describe the people who, who took part in that study. So as I mentioned, there were 188 participants. Uh, mean age was 47. Um, majority were men. Um, quite a, a different representation of um, ethnicities. Um, fairly highly educated. So 65% had a tertiary education, 65% um, employed. Most were living in major urban areas and over half um, had been living with HIV for more than 10 years. So this is what I mentioned. This is the, the scale um, between 13 and 65. So the mean summary score was just over 46. So to help kind of put that in some context, um, the team in Australia from their study, uh, the mean summary score there was um, just, just lower than 45. So a little bit lower than what, <clears throat> what we had in our study here. With the Australian um, cohort, it was mostly men who have sex with men, whereas ours was a, a mixture of men and women and, and men who have sex with men and heterosexual men and women. If we have a look at that um, categorically, we can see here, you know, 18% were categorized as having a low quality of life. 22% moderate, add those together, you know, you've got 40% who considered that their quality of life was low or moderate. So um, quite a high proportion um, rating their health, their, their quality of life low or moderate. So when we looked at the characteristics that were associated with um, the mean POSQUAL score, so I've broken it down into different groups. So if we first look at the socio-demographic characteristics of people, so being unemployed or on a government benefit, being unable to meet their basic needs, such as housing, food, that kind of thing, and people who had been diagnosed with HIV within the last five years all had a, what we will call a statistically significant lower um, mean POSQUAL score. Um, so what that means, if you're unemployed or on a government benefit compared to somebody who is employed, their mean POSQUAL score was, was um, lower by five. Or if they were unable to meet their basic needs, their mean low, um, POSQUAL score was lower by 4.47. So that's, that's what those coefficients mean on that right-hand side there. Their health-related characteristics. So people who rated their physical health as poor or people who had been diagnosed with a mental health condition also um, had a lower mean POSQUAL score. Social connectedness factors. Um, and I'm not sure if that's quite right, the right term, um, but people who had indicated on the questionnaire that they had decided not to have sex in the past 12 months because of, the, um, because of the, actually, no, I don't think, sorry, I can't remember that now. Um, it was basically, they said they had decided not to have sex in the past 12 months. And people who had, said that they had no support from people who were close to them on disclosure of their HIV. And then the last two um, questions were around stigma. So people who had experienced stigma or discrimination in the past 12 months had a lower post score and also people who 
um, had a lower internalized stigma score. So they said that they um, they felt guilty or they felt dirty or um, felt ashamed because of their HIV. Um, they also had a lower quality of life score. So I think from, from these quality of life data, it would, it would appear that greater investment in peer support and community welfare programs um, are needed to better support people living with HIV, um, particularly if they have poorer health and are unable to work. Um, I'm just going to come down to this third point. I think because of the factors being across each of those different characteristics of socio-demographic, health-related, social connectedness, and stigma, that there is that real need to think across that broad and multifactorial responses that are required through a cross-sector collaboration, that it's no one thing in particular that we can just focus on, but it needs to be right across um, the different disciplines and making sure that people living with HIV are supported um, and yeah, are supported and looked after. Um, and of course, the uh, stigma reduction campaigns targeting the broader community. Um, so just to sort of bring it to a conclusion, really, and bring it back to this 1990-90-90. Um, you know, we did have still 95 people diagnosed in 2020. Um, that's not a lot of people, um, you know, when we're thinking about global um, HIV, but if we're thinking about New Zealand and we have this opportunity for our HIV action plan, um, to end the new HIV diagnoses in New Zealand. 95 people, it's, it's still a number that we need to um, focus on, but it's very, I would say it's very achievable. Um, but it's still to remember that, yep, there's still 95 people who were diagnosed last year. Um, with the cascade of care and on treatment, it would appear that we're doing fairly well. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm sure that we are doing very well in New Zealand with that. And it's really around the, the actual monitoring and being able to, to measure that um, properly. And then I think with this last 90, the quality of, of life, there does seem to be some really big gaps. You know, 40% who rated their quality of life as low or moderate. Um, it would seem there's quite a lot to be, a lot of work to be done in, in that sphere. So I just want to acknowledge um, the organizers and sponsors for today's meeting. Really appreciate the fact that you've been able to switch to this virtual mode. Um, a lot of work going on behind the scenes to get that done. It's a lot of work to organize the treatment updates and then you have to switch it all to virtual. So thank you. Um, and yeah, of course, thanks to the Ministry of Health for our funding and all the healthcare providers and their support staff who continuously provide us with all this good data that we can then present back to you and my colleagues in the AIDS Epidemiology Group. So I'm happy. I think I've got about four minutes, Mark. I'm not sure. Um, very happy to take any questions if anyone has got anything. Um, that's that's great. Thank you, Sue. I think the data is really um, interesting. I think the drop in 2020 is really encouraging. Um, one concern would be that it's amongst European gay men in Auckland, um, and we need to make sure that we leave nobody behind. Um, so I think that's where we there's some of those granularities and subpopulations is where we really need to do some work to make sure that everybody's included in our strategy. Um, and I think your your emphasis on quality of life was really insightful because I know we focus on the elimination of transmission and getting to zero transmissions, but we need to make ensure that everybody has good quality of life. And I think that's really obvious from the data that you've presented that there are a number of challenges in that space. 
um, beyond just the healthcare piece, but all the other things that impact on people's lives. And I know um, one of the limitations that we looked at with the, with, um, the stigma index is um, how does it represent um, different ethnicities and uh, Maori in particular and how their quality of life is impacted and what we can do in those spaces to improve that as well. So I think it's, it's a good baseline for us to move forward from and I'm glad and encouraged by the data that you're presenting and where we're at today. And I think it's, it gives us a really good opportunity to show improvement over the next, you know, as we go to 2025 with the UNAIDS strategy um, and the HIV action plan to, to make changes in those spaces. So thank you for all your work. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions. If people want to put those through the chat, um, just remember that's in the bottom of the, the web page. If you put those up through the chat, I can pass those on. Um, just with so with the um, the challenges you're experiencing around getting those unknowns and the people that fall out of your calculations, I know that's an ongoing challenge. Um, I know in in New Zealand we we're lucky because we have universal access to care for everybody, regardless of residency. Um, so would one would some of those people be potentially the people that get lost because they're not New Zealand residents as such? Yes, yeah, I think they could well be. Um, so some of the ones, some of the people who might have been lost in the, that very early part of the cascade will be perhaps people who have had a test uh, for HIV and possibly for immigration purposes and then left the country. Um, so not being referred on. So technically then they come into our data as a new diagnosis in New Zealand, but then we can't find them anywhere in the country. Um, so some of them will be, will have been dropped there. Yeah. Um, with that first cascade of care data, I, I think the main gaps further on where we just did not get complete data sets from the viral laboratories, it was very um, complicated and difficult. Um, I feel a lot more optimistic now with having, we, we do have it all. Um, so I'm, I'm yeah, feeling very optimistic that we will be able to show uh, a much better 1990-90, probably way more than that. That's great. I'm glad you've got those um those, those relationships in place so that we can improve the data going forward and just continually show advances. Because I think with the, you know, the more complete data set that we'll get, as well as all the efforts that we're doing to make change and impact, we'll see that will just amplify where we're going. So yeah, thank you. And I think one of the things that you mentioned there, Mark, about, um, you know, use the focus is on 1990-90, um, and it's something that we've talked about before, but that, 10%, 10%, 10%, who are they? And, you know, we don't want to leave them behind. Um, and so if we can somehow figure out how, who, who they are, um, would be really good to know as well. And also looking at, you know, now that if we know who they are, how can we best reach those people That's and right. make that change? Because we want to get to zero, you know, 100%, but we want to make sure that it, nobody is left behind. So there's zero new cases, mm. zero AIDS deaths and things like that as well. So I think that's where the hard work is going to come. That's yeah. right. And, you know, it's like that that 10 percent. So the ones who, who perhaps do come here and are diagnosed for immigration purposes, you know, what does happen to them? Yeah. Um, well, we see know, a few of those and they get sent home. I so. think, yeah, I suspect they do get sent home, but we kind of, we don't know. Um, yeah. You know, we just get that they've been diagnosed and so that is is quite difficult yeah um, so we see that with some international students at our work where they come in and they've applied for a work permit and then they're denied the work permit so they're sent out of country and um that's because um the immigration laws need to change so people are allowed to stay if they're hiv positive so yeah. there needs to be some work in that space to make sure that they're able to engage in care and be supported and yeah so that's another challenge. <laughs> Thank you, work to be done. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that presentation. That was very really insightful. Thanks um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.